Go for it. So, so what? <laughs> Why don't I just say welcome to everybody to this Ideas That Matter. And indeed, we have today an idea that matters. And it's a collaboration of Inclusion Press and the Marshall Forest Center and Starfire and Tim and Jan and a myriad of others. But the idea under Ideas That Matter is we want to focus on things that actually will make a difference. And this story is quite remarkable because it traces the transition of a legacy organization that was doing wonderful work to an organization that is working with people and families to have full engaged lives in the community. And that is wisdom that needs to be shared. That is an idea that matters. Linda? It's my first Zoom. This is the fourth Ideas That Matter session of 2024. And I was looking back, there have been 20 of them. We started in September 2020 with John McKnight when we were just trying to figure out this Zoom thing. Um, we are so appreciative of the opportunity to gather for this book launch. Um, it's a great story of courage and coherence and lifelong learning and inconvenient truths and it'll be an mm. evening with um, readings and reflections of some small group conversation and we're just really happy to have you here folks you joined we're here from the u.s canada registrations from the uk spain and new zealand welcome 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 and i want to pass it to you carol um, Carol's the Family Network Coordinator for Starfire. Uh, thank you, Linda. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carol. I head up the family work here at Starfire. Uh, tonight, on behalf of Starfire, I just want to thank each of you for joining us this evening or morning, depending on where you're at and where you're Zooming in from. Uh, your presence tonight fills our heart, and we're grateful to see um, so many familiar faces in this space with us, but also uh, some new faces. So we are just delighted to have you all joining us tonight. Um, tonight, we get to honor the history of Starfire and set the stage for our next chapter, and we're really happy to have you all joining us in that. Um, it is my honor to introduce and hand it over to Jan Goings and Tim Vogt. Jan's going to be facilitating, and Tim is the man of the hour. So take it away for us. Thanks, Carol. And so glad so many of you are on again from so many places around the world and in different ways of connecting to um, our work. So just welcome again. Um, and Tim and I, and Tim's going to be able to jump in in a little bit, but we have planned um, three conversations, three kind of talking areas we'd like to approach. And then in between those, just times for you, oh, it's very, very small groups to just kind of have a little chat a little bit and right bounce back to the group. And so we have really planned a way for us to think about what we're listening and hearing and maybe some things that you might be thinking about in terms of the, the reading of what we've been talking about. And we know not everyone's read the book, but there's just going to be such an opportunity for a rich dialogue. So, so welcome. Tim, did you want to say anything before we kind of jump in? No, go for it, Jan. Just thanks for everybody for being here. <laughs> awesome. So I would just love to start with the first thing I noticed when I picked up this beautiful book. I know it's a little blurry. Who's in your life rethinking the social story of disability? The first thing that just caught my eye was this amazing um, drawing of Ohio, which is where Starfire is based out of, although we reach farther than that, the Ohio River, and learning more about the artist and why, Tim, that you made this selection about this, this cover. Could you start there, and then we're going to jump into uh, the context of the book. Sure. Yeah, I always start with a little bit of art. So this is a mural that is about six foot long and about three and a half, four foot tall. And it actually was the perfect cover. When we were talking about what the cover should be, I kind of brought this to Jack and he said, 
yep, that's what we got to go with. This is one of Starfire's very first community projects. So one of our big ahas, as many of you know, was that we had all these human beings with disabilities kind of trapped in our day program. And we were helping them do social skills and life skills and cooking skills. And it just kind of seemed as we learned more and more that there was more that they could contribute to the world. And one of the most interesting things we learned was when we could discover uh, some contribution that somebody had in waiting, <laughs> and then we could find some other people that shared that, really cool stuff started to happen. So this is by Krista Brinkmeyer and a team of about 10 other people from Cincinnati. And what they did was they went to, this is a map of Cincinnati's, uh, Ohio's kind of like geography. And they would go to every single neighborhood. And this is the nice thing of the high res image. I can zoom in a little for you. And they crowdsourced the best picture from every neighborhood. So they'd have a big potluck, invite all the neighbors and say, bring your favorite picture of Madisonville or Oakley or, you know, Westwood. And then all the neighbors would kind of talk about it and they'd pick one. And then they worked with a screen printer that put this into this map form. And then those artists got together and painted it. One of the cool things, if you get a copy of the book, and I can zoom in a little bit here, is during those potlucks, they actually asked people to write about their community. And there's a couple of these stories that are really pretty amazing. One down here is about saying that they were ashamed of the place they grew up in and they moved out as quick as they could. And then they moved back to their neighborhood and they discovered they could be part of building a better sense of community. And now they're proud to be from that neighborhood, which we thought was just terrific. So there's all these stories that are handwritten and those artists put these as the backdrop. So for us, this was one of those very first projects that allowed us to see there was so much more if we stopped wasting the time of people with disabilities and started to think about what could Krista offer the world that was outside of the label of disability and was also connecting her to other people. So we just thought it was a perfect little cover for the book. Is that what you wanted to hear? Jean? Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that was wonderful. And that's certainly a learning that's come over time for many of us in our work to be able to highlight and let gifts of people to really shine. So today we're going to have three brief conversations and I'm we would like to start kind of at the beginning. When I picked up the book, in addition to the cover, one of the things I read was Tim was serving as the executive director of Starfire from 2006 to 2017. And so in this book, as he writes, tells the story of that time and what he learned along the way, which gave um, him beautiful glimpses of a more inclusive future. Neighbors coming together, people discovering shared passions that can connect them in surprising ways and enriching their communities. Families forging alliances and allies that they've never imagined. But as he says, it always wasn't like that. And so this book begins with the journey of prior to that, that it always wasn't like that. And we like to begin with starting at the beginning, because I'm really curious about everyone's origin story around disability and their experiences and your first kind of awareness that someone with a disability might exist, whether as a family member or a parent or a childhood friend, and what that planted as a seed for one's understanding. So Tim, perhaps you can kick us off with maybe your first experiences that you talk about earlier in the book. Sure. Um, this is a story from my childhood and um, we'll just get right to it and read it. It's just a short little, short little snippet from the first chapter. Uh, this is a story of uh, me meeting uh, a boy in my class named Jimmy and sister Mary Janet asked a couple of us boys to help him because he used a wheelchair. Um, and this is a snippet here. We weren't trained on lifting Jimmy or helping in the bathroom beyond Jimmy's coaching and feedback. We never even wore gloves. We pushed his wheelchair in ways that could have possibly injured us all, but we did it and managed just fine. Sister Mary Janet 
either had the wisdom to know we could figure it out together or had no other choice, likely some combination. Either way, I got the impression that helping someone with a disability was a good thing to do in the world. Sister Janet and our teachers heaped praise on us for helping Jimmy. Our parents told us how proud they were of us. All of that felt great. Jimmy lived on my street, but we never really played together. He lived in a house on a hill with a long gravel driveway that may as well have been on a deserted island for how inaccessible it was. I never even met his parents. He rode the short bus, so there was no chance to talk on the long rides back and forth to school. And most recesses, he had to stay inside and use a walker, holding on to it as he willed his legs to move up and down the hallway. I'm guessing that was some kind of physical therapy designed by his parents or the school in hopes that his legs would strengthen. They never did. He used a wheelchair the rest of the time I knew him. All of that separation meant that I never got to know Jimmy through playground experiences, bus rides, and neighborhood games. I only got to know him through the help he needed. Tim, as you were sharing that, I remember you said that initially when you wrote the book, that chapter was not in the book. Can you tell why you decided to add that beginning piece? Well, I had sort of forgot about it. Okay. I started the book when I, um, the, the original first chapter is chapter two. Okay. And as I wrote the book, then again, I sent, I started to remember that I had earlier experiences and this one in particular stuck out because it was really, as, as you're writing, you know, it's a good chance to reflect on how your, your mind and your thinking gets formed. Mm -hmm. And uh, going through this was helpful for me to remember this day of being asked to help somebody and how that help turned into the story of how I related to Jimmy. So my little brother and sister, uh, Jennifer and Denny are on the call. Jen, Denny, that's right when you pass Marie Drive and go down that hill uh, back by the creek. That was his house on the right there. And um, and it was just fascinating to me that I never really got to play with him, got to know him, yeah. hung out with him at a birthday party or had him to mine. It just was always kind of like this helping story, which I didn't think was all that far off from a lot of people's story. Right, right. Yeah, and I know we all probably have learned cultural messages earlier on in our life about di difference or disability, and that begins to shape our understanding and hopefully evolves. And I just wanna read quickly before we jump into a few a, a small group kind of conversation. In chapter nine, you have this conversation with Judith Snow and uh, John McKnight and Peter Block around disability. And I just thought I'd highlight because there is, what is disability, I think? What does it ever mean? For one person, it means they might not be able to see or hear, or another might be in a wheelchair. And why does this label that doesn't seem to mean anything specific decide, define so many people's entire lives? And I think that was Judith Snow who was asking that question. And it's just something um, earlier on in this text to even help us consider that idea of disability and how it defines how we perceive others. So I'd like to just leave that there for us to consider. Linda, and Lisa with some questions. <clears throat> We're making space to be able to connect with one another in trios or pairs. And we wanna invite you to reflect and share with one another in response to a couple of questions. What sense are you making of this? Um, just think about where else you've seen or experienced this in your own story. And we'll have about seven minutes and Bridget Vogt is doing the tech and she's going to transport us into trios or pairs. Probably have a minute. We'll get a little warning sign, Bridge, when the time is over and then get whisked back. Oh, you're on mute. Kate has the uh, pleasure of being the only person on this call that know that saw me on my day I was hired. <laughs> I share that. I did. I hear that. I said I. I wanted to try. I, I can't take a hundred percent credit, but I remember saying I really like him. He's very cool. <laughs> yeah, but listen, you all are not going to be surprised. There's this guy Jim that we worked with back then. We're not going to tell his last name or anything, but he was the one interviewing me, and I'm not kidding. On my on my application to work at Starfire, on the side of his notes, it says in all caps, 
too enthusiastic with three question marks. That, that was the knock on me on January of 2000. Should I, should I be hired? Yeah. And high praise. High praise if it didn't really like you. I'll be honest. And Tim, yes. you're still cheerleading the cause. That's right. Well, but he since has sent me a few notes about that. So we're we're all good. But anyway. Mm. We all back bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have any reflections, you can put them in the chat. Um and and we can just keep moving on, I think. Oh. Jan and Tim. With oh, okay. Well, well, let's begin our second conversation. Top ready, Tim. Mm -hmm. So as I was thinking about this, um, we're going to jump ahead. You are now in your text here, in your story, the executive director of Starfire, right? And um, there's a lot of just beautiful things that happen under your leadership, right? There was a lot of praises, and accolades, and people were receiving services. And, and as you write, it felt really good, right? It felt really good and about those accomplishments. And that, what we were doing was really what other organizations were doing. Um, I hate to use the term state of the art, but that's kind of where that leadership was. But it seems somewhere, even as things were growing and expanding, you began to have this other voice in your head about, list, you were listening to parents more deeply, asking questions, listening to their questions and their concerns about, is this what we want for our person that we love? Or, or is this the future that we want? What is the culture shaped around people with disabilities? And it seems like you were asking, really kind of having some internal reflection around that. Um, I, there, was a, there was a passage in the book where you were in conversation with a mother and father who were asking you um, and talking to you about, you know, they really had never seen evidence of full inclusion for their loved one, for their daughter? Is it even possible? And it seemed like there were some messages going around our listening, our themes around wanting to dream about something different, but really concerned about isolation, loneliness, longing for connections and some reassurance about things could possibly be different. So I was wondering if you could maybe read some of that or share some of your thought process as you kind of evolved in your thinking about uh, how you thought about what we were doing with Starfire and what could be possibly next. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the great, great, uh, great question, Jan, the, the idea that we would change everything at Starfire once we kind of discovered that there was something better. And um, to be honest with you, that part of what we were doing was causing people to be lonely or to be lonelier, um, that I thought everybody was going to be like, heck yeah, let's go and change everything and make it happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but as soon as we started to talk about this out loud, instead of hearing, we said, we heard some heck yeah's, but we yeah. also heard some people saying, don't change anything. What you're doing is great for my kid. I'm really happy with it. Right. So Anyway, I, this this is a, a conversation that is almost verbatim um, that I had with um, the parents of a young woman with a disability who had been coming to our programs into our building for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, a mother and father, Bob and Melly, once asked me if we could meet to talk about their daughter Robin's involvement with Starfire. They had heard about some of our new ideas and were worried that our programs would change. Their biggest problem was that they, like any parents of adults with disabilities, had no evidence of long-term relationships for Robin. We just haven't ever seen it, Tim, Bob told me. No one lasts. Have you ever noticed a moment of inclusion, I asked them. Was there ever a spark that someone might see her in a caring way? Melly offered two examples. Once, while Robin was in high school, there was a guy with bright blue spiked hair. He talked to Robin respectfully and included her in things with her, his friends. She sighed and continued, but after high school, we never saw him again. Another time, she told me, Robin was connected to a student from a local college. She was wonderful. She would pick Robin up and they would go out with her college friends. Bob finished the thought. 
but then she graduated and went to grad school in Washington. She visited a few times at holidays and made it a point to connect with Robin when she was back in town. He sighed deeply. But once she got married and had children, we never heard from her again. Mm -hmm. It struck me how often they must have witnessed small moments like those. Their hopes rose seeing a friendship spark, but fell when the relationship faded. It also struck me that despite all the evidence, they were still thinking on it and hoping there was a way. It occurred to me that there was no one way. There wasn't going to be one friend that lasted forever and then Robin never needed more. I started to notice how much my own thinking was trapped in the idea of permanent solutions to fluid, evolving, and continuing problems. Do you think it's likely that the young man with bright blue spiked hair is still alive? I asked them. They agreed it was likely. Okay, so is it possible that he lives near a family with a child with a disability? We all agreed that it was possible. Then we got to the questions we could only imagine answers for. What would happen if that family knew that that person around the corner from them was the most inclusive person in Robin's life? They stared thoughtfully. And then I asked the same questions about the young college student. What would happen if her family and a family of a child with a disability in her neighborhood knew each other? What would happen if that family knew that around the corner was a woman who was raising a family to follow in her footsteps and how she treated Robin? And that led us to the last set of questions. If we assume the first two scenarios are a possibility and that people are missing out on knowing each other in those situations, is it also possible that there is a man who lives around the corner from you Bob and Melly, who used to be like the guy with the bright blue spiked hair in high school? Is it possible that one of the women around you used to volunteer at her college with a person with a disability? It hit me that it might be possible that what we long for, a person who is open to knowing a person with a disability, is right under our nose, and we just don't know it. And tragically, we weren't doing much to discover, nurture, and honor that possibility. Our questions had high stakes. All of us in that room had to consider the reality of loss and the responsibility of keeping hope alive. They were better questions than the ones we had been asking. They were holding us accountable to the idea that we could reach for more, but they were also scary. I could feel the breathtaking moment of commitment below the surface, but we left the conversation there. We were all missing each other. We dream of friendships, but a friendship takes work. It evolves over time. We can only have it if we invest years into it but it never happens if we don't invite people over for that first cookout or strike up a conversation at the grocery store. Those moments are awkward, but they are critical in starting the story of friendship. I mean, that's such a powerful passage. We were all dreaming of friendships, but a friendship takes work. It evolves over time. And that's just really powerful. And then I think you've also gone on to, so then where's Starfire's role in that? And, and, not a really a question, but as in your book, you write about the fact that when people aren't connected or cared for, protected and have that affection, sometimes really tragic things happen. And so those that is also the reality of what you write about, um, about some experiences you have with some people who just really need some additional support and looking after it. So that isolation and loneliness is, is really real. It's just part of our culture that we are really trying to address. Um, I love this line about, I could see that Starfire was just a placebo for friendship, <laughs> right? It's a powerful line. If anyone's following, we're on 107. Um, and that is kind of, I think, part of that shifting that was happening in your thought process as executive director, am I right? Like, what is Starfire's mm -hmm. new role? But, you know, Tim, as you were talking about, I appreciate the vulnerability and risk that you took about really listening to parents and being open to asking those deep questions, right? And, and not really, I mean, continuing to, to, to lead Starfire, but being open to what if there's something different? Where is that possibility? And what are the stakes here if we don't keep trying to figure that out? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny as... Um working with Carol and some of the other families that are on the call here, we always talk about, we have to be on the side of the child with a disability first, mm -hmm. but we have to be on the parent's side second, right? And that they also are getting the impact of being left out of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that was hard to balance was sometimes, you know, the interests of a person with a disability and the interests of their parents 
were in conflict. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had to name it <laughs> an right, awful right. lot and say things that were hard to say, but also hope that, that, um, and I, and I always do trust in, you know, family love. That's, right. that's what seems to save the day. A lot of times, you know, that the families are up for, okay, you're right. Like, you know, I have to figure out how to take a brave step or try something different. So yeah. it is a, it is bravery, isn't it? It's a risk. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Linda, would you like to take us and lead us into another small group conversation? No, oh, thank you. Well, I really, we really appreciate the question. What are the stakes here? And we want to invite people to think about that. And again, where else have you seen or experienced this in your own story? And what action might you take? Just reflect on those questions and Bridget has them in the chat. We'll get whisked into small groups. Well, welcome back, everybody. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So we have one more conversation, Tim and I, and I just, I, Tim, I would love for you to tell us where we are in terms of Starfire and your thought process and the changing in pattern. You identify in the book a pattern of rejected, controlled, lonely, limited, to changing that to a new pattern around people uh, with disabilities and our connections around acceptance, supported, connected, and free. That last one just gets me all the time. This was our new work. And that was worth fighting for, accept it, support it, connect it, and free. And so that new work, as you talk about really, and there's several things in here, so you, you pick what you want to share, but you do spend some time talking about new colleagues and seeing parents as colleagues in the, in the work, that, in the real work, the real work of making change. And I'd love for you to kind of share that um, and talk about that a little bit, if you would. Sure. Um, well, the pattern you're talking about is some data and it drives the story, right? And our my friend Heather Simmons is on here and she helped me really kind of like, Tim, this, this is, you got to keep talking about this data thing. And the more that I started putting it in there, I realized it's just like, ta we call it, say it's tattooed on the back of our eyelids. We think about this data all the time, which is that a lot of people with developmental disabilities uh, have very few social connections, lots of paid staff, lots of uh, segregated places, which we ran some of those places, right? So um, anyway, it's important, I think, that you take data and you start to say, okay, so what's the impact on people? And that's the first kind of uh, thing you talked about, Jan. And then the second thing that data asks, not only is what is the impact on people, but what what do you do about it, right? What do you, What are you hoping for? And so as we started to realize that what we were looking for was this anti-pattern, this like lots of people, you know, lots of opportunities, we started to realize that the whole problem wasn't disability, it was culture. It was the way our culture makes life hard for people with disabilities and their families, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was really helpful because all of a sudden we didn't have to figure out how to fix anybody. We didn't have to figure out how to do anything other than partner with each person, their family and their neighborhood to say, what can we do to make this neighborhood, this block, mm -hmm. this place, this experience mm -hmm. more inclusive and for everybody, right? right. Better. Right. Right. So all of a sudden we realized that people with disabilities weren't our clients, they were our colleagues. And that was really liberating um, for us as an organization. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. only that, but like Bridge and I had this interesting thing where we come home every day and we wonder why we were working so hard at this problem over in Cincinnati, but we come across the river into Kentucky and we still didn't really interact with right. people with developmental yeah. disabilities here in, in Bellevue. We didn't want to start a nonprofit. We knew that we had already kind of like gotten tired of that. And so we started to really think about how do you live a life that makes things more conducive to inclusion. So, um, and what I, I know of you, all, and I know you're going to read something. It is not a position or a job. It is just who you and your family are, right? Yeah, in terms of making that. Yeah, point. otherwise you're you're using people again, right? Just in a different form. So we mm -hmm. knew we couldn't do that. We had to figure out how do you just live a life that makes you know the place that you're in 
more inclusive and that's what we try to do so there's stories of that in there and how we came yeah. to that which is yeah. which is really fun to think about everybody could do that sure is there a section you'd like to read for us a little bit sure it's a shorter one than the last one um but at the end of the day you know what we're trying to do is figure out how do you create better change and um, sometimes it can get overwhelming. It often did for us. When you start saying, oh my gosh, the culture has to change, you think you're you're out to change the world. So I just wrote a passage about that at the end of the book, toward the end of the book. Um, changing the world is a deeply personal effort. It's more like changing my world. Mm -hmm. I really only have an ability to do that for myself and to a certain extent, my work, my family, and my community. But even those efforts have limits as other people's worlds are connected to them. The best part is that making all these efforts is a pretty great way to live a life. It yeah. brings us into more and deeper relationships. It gives meaning to our days. It helped us find ways to give to other people and to receive from them. It turned out that changing the world was more about the journey than the destination. Arriving at some utopian perfect future was a fantasy, but working toward it each and every day in some way was infinitely possible. And it is as close to perfection as we will ever get. And it is the best way I've found that anyone anywhere can build a better culture for human beings with disabilities and their families. Including a neighbor gets left out of everything might not change the world, but for that person, for that family, the world will certainly change for the better. That's beautiful. One individual, one family at a time. And one family at a time. And I know that you and Bridget, this is not, work or career it's just who you are and i certainly have met your sons and this is just a part of um your family's commitment to really just make connections in their local community and just um live that out live that out and that's actually really quite powerful i think we could go maybe to a small group conversation really quickly and then we'll come back have tim give some final words and maybe take some q a that's great Folks, just think about what's resonating for you here and think about what's possible in your work um, or in your life and who stands to benefit from your actions. Share with each other what you're thinking about. All right. Welcome back, good people. I believe everyone has re-entered re this large group with us. Um, if you have any reflections from your small group, please drop those in the chat and share with us. We, as we round out our time together, I do want to share that um, uh, we're going to hang on the line tonight for a little bit longer. If anyone has any burning questions, how to respect for time, we're going to ask. Uh, we have two quick questions for Tim tonight. Um, so we're going to jump right into that. And Tim, if you're ready for this, um, the the first question that, that has been posed for asking is what part of the book, um, what what part of the book did you have the hardest time writing? Whoever submitted that question, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are two two parts that come to mind, and they're just uh, wrenching, really. It was, um, the hardest was absolutely um, the chapter on the pain of parents. Um, <sighs> parents um, that were willing to, on behalf of their children, whose voice isn't heard, express what must be um, just a fraction of what their kids, their children would, would probably say that living with an intellectual disability must be like. Having to write that, having to, I mean, there are, there are parents who, um, I just, I don't think you can look away, you know, and they told me through conversation, they told me through their actions. So that chapter is absolutely devastating to write. It's also devastating to read. But again, if we ignore it and we don't talk about it, then everything seems to go along and everybody thinks it's hunky-dory and it's not. 
So that was in number one by far the hardest chapter to write. Um, but there's other parts where essentially like what I kind of came to understand was that I could represent as a person uh, the trouble, the two forms of trouble that people with disabilities are up against. Uh, one comes in the form of an absent community. So by not knowing a single person with an intellectual disability in my hometown uh, and not really knowing many of my neighbors, which is in the in the book, I I was embodying that absent community. And so writing about that absence and taking responsibility for it is really hard because it doesn't feel awesome <laughs> to talk about that. Right. Um and then um, the second bit of trouble is how the system and services try to fix that that problem, fill that hole, right? And accidentally make it worse because then the isolation gets uh, reified. It gets created as a as a, as a um, as almost like a a given. And so uh, then I had to write a lot of chapters about that uh how how it felt to be really confident that I, I was uh the bee's knees and um actually we were creating the problem so fessing up <laughs> is probably the uh <laughs> the hardest thing to write um there is a chapter in there that i had um a neighbor of mine we, we started a little if you're ever doing something creative we started this monday morning 6 a.m creatives anonymous meeting we were all like <laughs> writing or making music or something or doing art and we all found ourselves kind of getting stalled out right and we would avoid it because like facing a blank page is really scary so we ended up creating this meeting where we had to show up every monday for a year <laughs> at 6 a.m at our neighbor's house and I wrote this chapter during that time that was about me um, just completely ignoring a guy with a developmental disability that I was out to lunch with, just like getting on my phone, thumbing through because he wasn't responding. He didn't really talk. And so I was like two minutes of asking him questions. He's not answering me. So you can read that. And th I, I wrote that and I gave it to my friends and neighbors. And I was like, but I'm not putting this in the book. <laughs> and they were like, <laughs> you're putting it in the book and you have to. So those are really, really hard chapters. All that was really hard to write, but I think it was important, so. As a parent who's read the book, Tim, though it was a hard chapter to read, but I appreciate you naming that that hard piece. Um, the work you did to change has had just a beautiful impact. So thank you for that. Um, I want to go ahead and kick it over back to Jan and Tim. I have another question for you, but I also just want to respect everyone's time. So Jan, do you want Well, first of all, I just want to say just thank you for everyone joining. I know we're going to have Tim have the last word, but this has just actually been really insightful. And I continue to reread this book many times. And there's just passages that really jump out and, um, just reminds us of what we are, where we've been and the possibilities of something new. So I just appreciate that. And thanks for the opportunity to continue this dialogue with all of you. And Tim, thank you for, you know, you know, being open and taking the opportunity to help, to help let us understand your story and what that means for Starfire. So definitely would love for you to have the last word and message to all of us. Is that right, Carol? Well, I mean, the last word is gratitude. I'm really appreciative of human beings with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, the people that I've known and their families, uh, the chance to learn from and with them, and the chance to, I think, do do better um, and, and kind of be gracefully forgiven for all that stuff. You know, really, it's been, uh, I'm really appreciative of that. But also just so many mentors, you know, like there's a lot of them on this call and and in my life that that kind of held my hand and helped me along the way and colleagues too, um, you know, namely Bridget. I mean, she works at Starfire. We've worked together now for 25 years and it's every day. This is a conversation, you know, in our house and in our lives. And so I'm just really grateful. Um, the things that I think I'm grateful for is that what I learned along the way is I'm grateful for the opportunity to always learn more. There is always more to learn um, from so many other people from the past, 
you can learn from the future. Like I remember like tough times when I had to make decisions, I would ask like, what would a baby born in 10 years think about this? You know? And it was just really fun to kind of like really think about what the future was asking me to do. And it gave me some courage. Um, I think that you can always try new things as well. I'm really grateful for the opportunity that we have to try new things um, and to grow. And mostly I think that, um, you know, I'm grateful for the ability to act just where I am, you know, like I don't need um, the, like, you don't have to like, feel like you won the world, you know, you can just take an action where you are and, and that is enough on a daily basis, you know, so I'm really grateful for that. It's always there. You can always take action. You can always, you can always do one thing, you know, or talk to one person. So I'm grateful for all those things. Thank you, Tim. Thanks everyone for attending. We're going to hang on the line. If you have burning questions, feel free to hang on the line with us, but also know that you can, you can hit that leave button and, and be okay too. So. Okay.